Uh, so let me begin. And the first thing I want to tell you is about what I mean by the title. Um, and you'll understand more as the talk goes on. But by likelihood free, I mean that I'm never going to tell you how to compute the PDF. And I'm going to discuss a few different methods for doing that. And we'll see how that goes throughout the rest of the talk. Um, but like everyone else, to begin, I need to tell you a little about the science. Um, so I'm a high-energy physicist. Our goal is to identify the smallest length scale structures in, in the universe. And to do so, we need to build a giant microscope. The energy of the probe particle sets the length scale that can be observed. So uh, if you want to, for instance, observe structures that are larger than hundreds of nanometers, optical microscopy is sufficient. But to go smaller, you need to increase, increase the energy of the probe particle. Arguably, the first high-energy physics experiment was at the turn of the last century with the discovery of atomic structure. And a similar technique was used at Stanford to discover nuclear structure with high-energy electron beams. And in the present day, the most powerful terrestrial microscope is the Large Hadron Collider, which is a 20-mile circular beam in Geneva, Switzerland. Here's a small segment of the um, collider itself. And here's a small piece of the uh, uh, five-story beauty, which is the Atlas detector, the one I work on um, in Geneva, Switzerland. It's uh, five stories, a uh, huge um, detector 100 meters below ground, and has the precision to measure trajectories of particles within uh, microns. So really, it's, a, it's an impressive feat. And this allows us to um, probe uh, energy physics in great detail. Here's a, a view of what a, a collision might look like. So we collide protons. It's the Large Hadron Collider. Hadrons are a class of particles, like protons. Why we didn't call it the Large Proton Collider, I don't know. I guess LPC doesn't sound as cool. Um, and so protons come in from, from in this picture from the left or right. They're traveling at basically the speed of light. And uh, they collide and not go some collision debris. And these uh, uh, lines and blobs here are reconstructed trajectories of charged and neutral particles. And one of the fundamental goals of, of the LHC is to identify um, new high mass objects that might be produced in this collision that were inaccessible at previous colliders due to the limited energy. Um, so if you remember e equals mc squared, if you want to make something that's very massive, you have to pump in a lot of energy. And we have the highest energy, most powerful microscope in the world, and therefore we are, may be able to make um, the famous question mark particle um, shown here. OK, so that's my science introduction, now let me tell you how that connects to generative modeling. So generative modeling is, is essential in high-energy physics. We have the benefit that as a very mature field, we have a, basically a theory of everything. And uh, we, we, in, we can understand it in great detail. So we have uh, our theory, which is the standard model of particle physics. You heard a bit about this yesterday um, in Fiala's talk. But in order to connect the theory of everything um, with the objects we see in our detector, we need um, this black box here, which is uh, physics simulators. So the physics simulators connect uh, our fundamental theory to um, what we can observe in the detector. And of course, we like to compare our simulated version of that with the real version of that, where nature uh, gives us uh, similar um, features, and we can compare uh, on both sides and, and try to understand what the properties of the theory of everything were. Um, so this pattern recognition step is actually a place where we also do a lot of machine learning. Um, but today, I'm only going to talk about this box here and how uh, deep learning in particular can help accelerate or enhance um, the inference that we do with uh, uh, this box. OK, so there's going to be two parts of this talk. First, I'm going to talk about GANs. And I'll talk about GANs as an ab initio generator, so a way to generate um, new events. Uh, and I'll talk about in the context of accelerating simulation. And then um, I'll discuss uh, high dimensional reweighting, which can be thought of as another way of sort of doing generation. And I'm going to talk about reweighting without having uh, probability distribution functions, so it's still likelihood free. And once we have a reweighting function, I'll also discuss how you can do likelihood free inference, so that is, determine the parameters of the theory using a likelihood free reweighting function. OK, so first with GANs. Um, there are multiple ways that GANs have been studied in high-energy physics, and I'm only going to talk about one of them today, which is to accelerate simulations, but I thought I would at least highlight a few of the other ways in which people have studied, uh, myself included, people have studied using GANs. So in particular, um, one may also be able to use GANs to save disk space. So if you have, a, for instance, a, a library, a very expensive, a very cheap to produce but heavy to keep on disk library that you need to sample from, then uh, it may be better to, in fact, just store the weights of a neural network that you can just sample from on the fly. Um, and this is actually quite promising for adding noise to our simulations, where we have very cheap models of noise, but we'd like to, uh, but we have to store them on disk, which is expensive. And GANs can also be used, um, in particular conditional GANs can be used um, to also make, uh, make such libraries and have them uh, be sort of like high dimensional templates, uh, which, can, which can then be used for various um, 
uh, calibration procedures. So I'm not going to talk about saving disk space or high dimensional interpolation. I'm happy to discuss later. Today, I'm going to focus on accelerating simulations. So in order to do that, I have to tell you what a simulation at the LHC looks like. So here's a schematic diagram. Uh, it's not to scale. <laughs> Basically, we have to simulate processes spanning physical processes spanning 20 orders of magnitude. So at the smallest distance scales, we're probing distances are something like 10 to the minus 20 meters. And to give you context, so an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, it's an angstrom, and uh, a nucleus is like 10 to the minus 15 meters, that's a Fermi. So we're probing five orders of magnitude smaller than that, and we have to simulate the dynamics of that, what we call hard scatter collision, and then out goes um, quarks and gluons, those quarks and gluons fly apart, they then form uh, bound states that are called hadrons, those hadrons are shown here in, in these green circles, and then those are what hit our detector, and when they hit our detector, uh, we have to propagate those particles through all the detector material, and uh, there are various kinds of detectors. So our detector is sort of like a, a series of cylindrical shells. Each shell is a different detector technology. Um, so this is supposed to, re to show uh, a pixel detector that doesn't stop particles but measures trajectories, and these are supposed to represent calorimeters which basically stop particles and measure the heat to determine the energy. And this whole process uh, spans, like I said, 20 orders of magnitude and can take a minute per event. So that's really slow, especially if we need to simulate like a trillion events. Obviously that becomes prohibitive. Uh, so uh, the most important part actually, in terms of speed, or in terms of computational resources, is this last part. So it turns out that simulating the hard scatter, so the incoming um, protons, the stuff inside the protons, the outgoing hadrons, that's actually pretty fast. And we spend uh, an order one fraction of all high energy physics computing resources, um, not including uh, lattice calculations, which are definitely an order one fraction of all resources, but uh, taking that out, the next big uh, chunk is uh, um, the interaction of particles with our detector. Because basically what we have to do is we have to propagate the energy from the high energy scattering, so that can be hundreds of giga electron volts, all the way down to the ionization energy, which are like electron volts. And so that huge energy range that we have to span, um, which produces large cascades of many uh, ionization particles, takes forever. And the state of the art is called JAM4. It's a really amazing software package that includes many, many, basically all the physics, all from across that entire range of energy, um, but it's, it just takes a long time. So our goal is to replace, or at least augment, simulation steps with a, a faster, power, more powerful generator um, based on uh, state-of-the-art machine learning techniques. And so uh, our, go our goal here is to basically learn the JNOT simulation to emulate it with a, with a GAN that can be faster and hopefully achieve similar fidelity. And I want to attack the most expensive part, which is the calorimeter simulation. So in all those stacks, the one that's the slowest is the calorimeter because that detector stops the particles, and so that really has to bring it down from the high energies to low energies, and therefore is the slowest part. Okay, uh, so here's the schematic picture again, and the way that this is gonna work is we can take advantage of a sort of factorization. So a given event that the LHC may have hundreds or thousands of particles, and so we, we're not trying to generate uh, a generator that can do all of them at once. Um, not only would that be really hard to do, it would be very hard to validate. Because in order to sample the tails of the distributions, you'd have to get the tails of the thousand, dimension, the thousand particle distribution correct. So instead, we take advantage of a really important property, which is that the energy deposited in any given part of the detector is just due to the sum of all the energies of the, of the particles that hit that part of the detector. So all we really have to do is learn generator that takes as input one particle and outputs the energy deposition inside that part of the detector. This is still really complicated because our detector is complicated, but it only needs to take as input the momentum and direction of that one particle. And then we can attach to all thousand particles in the event again. And then in that way, we can generate an entire event without having to get the tails of the full thousand particle distribution, because if we get the tails of each individual particle distribution, we can appeal the common works and then generate large numbers of new events um, without having to ever have trained on entire events all at once. Uh, okay, so there's a technical point, which is that um, this factorization is actually broken by some parts of the simulation. So after we emulate the energy deposited by these particles, we have to then turn that into some kind of electronic signal that emulates what we see in the detector, uh, in the actual detector. And that part actually breaks it because um, electronic noise is nonlinear. Um, but so we do everything before that part, and then later you can pass through with a normal, called digitization procedure, and that's relatively fast. Okay, so now on to some machine learning. Uh, so I, I'm going to just give a, a very brief um, overview of how the, the GAN is going to work. So a generator, as you know, is nothing other than a function that maps random noise to structure. 
And in our case, the structure will be images representing a calorimeter. And so what does a calorimeter image look like? So you can imagine a calorimeter is a chunk of material that's segmented, meaning that uh, it's constructed by some cells, and each cell can register the energy deposited in that localized region of the detector. And so here is what a, a calorimeter image might look like. So it's a um, grayscale image where the, the, the pixel intensity is the energy deposited in a you know, particular part of a, a particular cell in the detector. And uh, you can just already see that they're kind of boring pictures. They're st relatively structureless and sparse, and that's going to be a challenge. It's a common challenge across scientific um, applications, but they're images, most importantly. Um, however, they're not like regular images, and that's because our calorimeter is not a single image. It's actually multiple images. So as I mentioned earlier, it's, our detector is actually a series of cylindrical shells. So you can think of each of these as one of the, a piece of, that, of those shells. So we have multiple images. And that would be fine, but actually, so there's some other complications. So they don't all have the same granularity, which is say that I have images with different pixel sizes, and they can be dramatically different. So the, for instance, the, in this case, the innermost layer has a pixel size which is like 100 times smaller than the one behind it. Um, but also, of course, there's a causal structure. So particles are actually moving from here to there. So the image here determines what the image over here looks like. So it's more like a small movie where each frame has a different pixel size. So this is a slight complication. Yeah. Right, so, so the, the, the full particle here, so this is just a chunk of it. You can imagine like some um, stereographic projection. That's like what I'm looking at here. And the coordinates that are specified, you need to know the energy, the type of particle, the angle of inclination, there's two of them, and then the position on the surface of the detector. So those are all the coordinates that specify the detector, yeah. It's even more complicated, I'm not gonna mention it here, but actually the detector doesn't, is, not, is not uniform everywhere, um, which even is more complicated, but let's forget about that for now. Um, okay, uh, so I think people here are probably familiar with GANs, but just super quick, um, the idea is um, noise to structure over here, and there's a second network that tries to distinguish the two images and decide if uh, the images are real or fake, and the idea is that the real, quote unquote, real images here are still simulated images, but they're from our very expensive simulator. And we would like to have our generator learn to produce the expensive simulator as well as possible, because um, it's much faster. OK, so here's a, a picture of the guts of what we call Calogan. It's very fashionable, of course, to append whatever you're working on to GAN. So this is Calogan, or calorimeter GAN. And uh, in this case, it's going to produce uh, three images. So the output is one image, one grayscale image per layer of this three-layer detector. Uh, you'll see in a second that it's actually pretty easy to extend it to more layers. Um, the inputs are some information about the particle itself. So in this picture, it's just the energy. But in principle, we actually need to condition on also the coordinates and also the particle type. So we, we take as input the energy. And there's, of course, some latent space. And the latent space here is just a Gaussian. Um, but the first thing we do is to try to help the GAN is we, we scale the latent space by the energy. So that at least sets the right scale so that the latent space uh, is rough, the pixel intensity latent space is roughly correct. And then we have this, this uh, series of um, uh, modules here. So the first module, this thing that says LA GAN, means locally aware GAN, and I'll explain that in a second. But it's basically just a module that makes an image. So for the first layer, we take the latent space, we take the latent space um, use this module, generate an image. Then um, for the second layer, we do the same thing, generate another image, different granularity. But we want to build in causality. So we do that by taking the image from the first layer, resizing it so that it has the same physical size as the second layer, and then doing a combination so that uh, we have some contribution from independent noise and from the first image so that when we combine the two, we get an image which knows about the layer that came before it. And the same thing for the third layer. So the third layer, we have another independent image which has the right granularity that's combined with this other image from the second layer which is resized. The combination then allows us to build in this causality and then we have another image. So basically we now have three images and they should know about the structure so that this one knows about this one and this one knows about that one. And we have one network per particle type. In principle you could also um, share weights and have some kind of conditional GAN that knows about the different particles but we found actually in practice this was easy enough because there's only a small number of particles you have to worry about. On the other side, you have a discriminator. The discriminator is a very similar structure, just backwards. So the discriminator takes as input three images and outputs, is it real or fake? And in this case, we want it to know about, we want it to um, know about physics. So for instance, it should know about energy conservation. Um, it can't just generate random um, 
uh, pixel intensities. So it takes the input of the images as well as the particle energy. And the first thing that the, the input does, it has these other modules which now take as input images and output some, some features. Uh, but what it does is, the first thing it does is it computes what is the energy of the three pixel, the three images. And what it's going to do is it's going to, as part of the loss function, it, it has some constraint that wants this energy to be as close as possible to the input energy. So that energy is conserved. And we have some mini-batch discrimination, which allows um, some regularization to help for mode collapse, um, which I'll tell you, say more about later. Um, but this energy feature and some mini-batch features then combine to um, give uh, the real or fake signal. Um, now I'll say a bit more about these locally connected layers. So for images, the first thing you might think of using is a convolutional neural network, um, which is sort of schematically shown here. Um, however, the way these images are set up, we've already centered them. And there's no rotational, or there's no, so there's no further degrees of freedom, basically. And so a convolutional neural network is actually not that great um, because we don't have any translation invariance. However, it would be great if we had some weight sharing so we could reduce the number of parameters because having a fully connected network on these huge images uh, is also not ideal. So one compromise between having full weight sharing in CNN and full not weight sharing with a fully connected network is to have a locally connected network, which is basically the same thing as a CNN but in patches. So for some reason, locally connected layers are not super popular, um, but in this case, uh, it's sort of a hybrid that allows us to chunk off parts of the image, and within the image, you have filters, and there's no global weight sharing, but there's local weight sharing, and there's some compromise between having um, tons of uh, weights and a small number of weights. Okay. So here's some results that show that um, it seems to work. So here's the average images for the three different layers. This is the physics-based simulator. This is the Calogan. And we've generated some huge number of images and taken the average. Of course, the average is a really small, uh, low-dimensional projection of this high-dimensional space. So this is necessary, but obviously not sufficient to show that it's working. Um, and it seems to work pretty well, but of course, you can see that there's some uh, non-smooth features that, you, that are present here. And this is not statistical because there's like 100,000 images that are shown here. Um, and you'll see a bit more of this as I um, show more, more plots. But we can examine now in more detail to see what's going on. So here's the distribution now of the energy in each layer. <coughs> so we just sum the pixel intensities over all the, the image. And for each of these is the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. And then there are multiple lines. So the, the filled histograms are the physics-based simulator, and the open parts are the GAN. <coughs> and there are three different colors corresponding to three different kinds of particles. So there's electrons, photons, and the pion. And the pion's just a cousin of the proton. And you see that they're qualitatively different shapes because they have different stopping powers within the calorimeter that we've simulated. And across many orders of magnitude, actually, you see they're qualitatively, some of the features are well captured by the GAN, so in particular these non-trivial features um, that are shown here. But there are also some non-physical effects, artifacts in the GAN. So in particular, you see this, this dip here for the purple that's not present in the physics-based simulator. So clearly there's room for improvement, but, but overall, um, qualitatively, it seems, seems pretty good. And of course, we can, if these are what we cared about, we can just bake these directly into the loss function. Um, but we need to have some holdout way to validate that it's working. In fact, this is actually, in my mind, the key challenge of using GANs. The key challenge is that if I give you a GAN, how do you know it's a good GAN? So if you have a classifier, you can monitor a single function. Basically, you look at the AUC or the accuracy or whatever. And you know that your, base, your classifier should be learning something monotonic with a likelihood ratio. So there's only a one-dimensional function to learn. Here, we're learning an order thousand dimensional function, and I have no good way of looking at a thousand dimensions and deciding if it's good or not. So this is a key challenge. I actually think a place where science applications can make a big impact, because uh, in industrial applications, there's a lot of um, it looks good or not, and here that's just not acceptable, basically. Um, OK, uh, so we can do some, we can try to probe in some ways high dimensional um, features of this network to see if it's doing OK. Um, here are just some, some ideas, so in particular, one thing we can do is we can look at the distance, the nearest neighbor between an image in my GAN data set and my physics data set. So here is the just pairwise Euclidean distance, treating my images as vectors um, between, this is the take, uh, uh, um, take a GAN image and find the nearest, jam, nearest physics image. And here's the physics image, find the nearest um, GAN image. And ideally, these would, have, would not have spikes at zero. If they have spikes at zero, it's memorizing. So it's not memorizing. There's no spikes at zero, which is maybe not so surprising because GANs are really bad at memorizing. Um, and the fact that they look the same is, is, is good. Um, but you can do another test, which you can ask, um, is there mode collapse? So one way that you'd find mode collapse is that if you take an image and you ask for its closest image in the same data set, would there be a localization somewhere? So these are now the 
GAN nearest neighbors and the physics nearest neighbors. And the fact that all four of these images look qualitatively similar is a good sign. Um, it's indi indicative that there's no um, gross um, memorizing or mode collapse, but um, the fact that there are, some, there are some differences, which suggests that there are some, maybe some small regions of phase space that are over or underpopulated. Okay, uh, I'll say one thing about extrapolation. So GANs are not good at extrapolation, they're very good at interpolation. But in this model, um, actually there's no reason why you can't query something outside the data set. In particular, we trained with energies between one and 100, and you can just ask, give me 150, 150 GeV particle. And um, it, it does an okay job, so it seems to know that it should still conserve energy. Um, and so the GAN will, will happily, smoothly go on. Um, this is, of course, not, rel not applicable if the physics changes once you go beyond the regime of, val of validity, um, but it's kind of cool to see that you can query things outside and it's not totally crazy. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have to condition, so not only on energy, but also on other attributes. So this, these top plots show what happens if we uh, take, in a, take a one image uh, and then just scan the energy. So we fix the latent space, and you can see uh, how the images uh, change as I change the energy. So this is the first layer, second layer, third layer. And for instance, if you look at the second layer, you see that there's m the pixel intensities are getting larger as I increase the energy, which is good. So this is almost a trivial one because we've baked in this into the network. This one's less trivial. So here we're conditioning not only on energy, but also X and Y, so the position in the calorimeter. Um, and so now we do, we do the, the same thing. So we fix the latent space and just change uh, the x direction, which would be up and down in this plot. And so if you look here, you can see very clearly by eye that it's learned to move the image from the top to the bottom. And this was not baked in, this is actually learned um, in a conditional way in the network. So that's good news. Okay, now the main reason we did this in the first place is because of timing, it's very fast. Uh, so here are just, is a table that gives you some representative numbers for um, comparing the evaluation of, say, the physics-based simulator on a CPU with, the, um, with batching and evaluation of Calogan on a GPU. So there's like five orders of magnitude between the two. So that's is expected. It should be much faster. That was the whole point. Um, and now, really, the, the key um, point is that can we, be, can we achieve fidelity and fast? Um, and that's what I'll just mention uh, before, I, before I conclude. Um, but the last thing I want to say about Calogan is that um, this is actually being implemented now in the collaborations at the LHC. And here's a plot, which uh, it doesn't matter at all what this, this is. What I'm most excited about this plot are two things. Um, one, it says Atlas. That's the experiment I work on. And two, it says GAN. Um, that's basically all that's relevant from this plot, which is to say that this collaboration is, uh, our collaboration is actually integrating these tools into our workflow. And you may ask me why I'm so excited about that. Um, well, aside from the fact that um, we have an aging workflow that's been established by a lot of people, uh, my collaboration has 3,000 people. So here's 10% of the collaboration. You can't even see me, I'm a little speck right there. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, how particle physics works, every paper that we write has 3,000 authors on it. Uh, yeah, I guess they're also scared about this, yeah. So this is, um, and, and actually if you look carefully, you won't even see my name on this because this is just page one. Uh, if you scroll down some pages, you can look and find my name. It's somewhere squarely in the middle. Um, so just to say that that's really a huge um, uh, step forward that we've managed to incorporate this kind of sophisticated uh, analysis technique into our workflow. And so I think GANs and FRIENDS are really a promising solution to um, the mounting collider half computing problem. Uh, and uh, there's a growing list of variations of, of, of techniques which are um, you can find by looking for the references of th things that cite the Calogan paper. Um, and the key challenge I would say now is not just um, the technical implementation, but now achieving precision. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to say any more about Calogan, but that, that's one of the difficulties is, like I said, knowing when a GAN is a good GAN. Um, and so for high precision tasks, we'll need some other techniques. And so what I want to talk about now is um, something completely different, um, which is high dimensional reweighting. So in the GAN case, it's ab initio. The idea is that I want to generate uh, an image from noise. But imagine I actually wanted to take advantage of a big database of existing simulations. How can I use those um, uh, to generate some new simulation? And that's what I'll talk about here. And I'm going to talk about three applications. So one is if I uh, want to make a new simulation from another, so morphing. Um, then I'll talk about how to make that. Yes. So um, when you want to make uh, like a co statement about confidence of whether you have detected something in the end or not, wouldn't it be favorable to have like a tractable likelihood model for doing things like that instead of like a 
for this? For, for a GAN or for? Like in general, if you, if you make a simulation uh, and you want to ah, okay. simulation predict whether a measurement you took is you know, that kind of particle yes. that it's exposed or something else, yes. would it be more favorable to have a likelihood, tractable likelihood model rather than a non likelihood? It would always be great to have a tractable likelihood. It's just never possible. So the, the, um, all we are able to do here is evaluate the forward model. And it's a very expensive forward model and very complicated, and there's no way to do likelihood, to get the full likelihood. We can never write it down, not even approximately. Sure. Um, in some very special cases, you can write down a sufficient statistic, which, and the, like, the simple likelihood of that. So like for the discovery of the Higgs boson, we had a relatively simple likelihood function, which was, we were possible, was possible to do because it was a very simple final state. Um, but in general, it's not possible. And so all these techniques are about what happens if I can only evaluate the forward model. In this case, so that I'm talking about now, is imagine I have one simulation where I've run the forward model many times, and it was expensive to do so, but now I want to be able to morph it into another data set. Um, and in particular, if I have some continuous way of doing that, then I might be able to do parameter estimation, and that's the whole point here. So still likelihood free, but um, using an existing simulation to sort of sc scan out the likelihood contour. But isn't it possible that the simulation would produce, I mean, even if kind of looks overall good, uh, you are sometimes interested in very rare events. Right? Absolutely. So something that happens like I mean, once in 10 to the 9. So That's actually pretty common, but yeah. It's <laughs> very difficult to find out whether a GAN produces some very weird effect uh, very rarely. Right, so in the, yeah, in, the, in the GAN case, like I said, I think it's not useful for generating whole events okay. because there we, we do need 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, 10 even rare. So the Higgs boson is like, 10 to the minus 12-ish, so it's you know, really rare. So there's no way I can get a GAN to get 10 to the minus 12 tail, right? So instead, we have this factorization. So we have the various parts, and the GAN only has to get right. How do I take a particle and turn it into a splash in the calorimeter? Okay. And that we can validate in data independently, and then we just take advantage of comment works. And I think that's possible to make work, but yeah, whole events I think is hopeless, for exactly the reason you point out. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so now it's reweighting. So I'll, I'll mention how we can um, do discrete morphing, continuous morphing, and then um, parameter estimation. Um, so the idea uh, is that, as I've already tried to motivate multiple times, detector simulation is very expensive. That's like this um, Shayna I told you about. Um, but pre-detector particle simulations are cheap. So if you remember, I factorized the um, simulation into multiple parts. There's, where you, you, there's the hard scatter part where you have the outgoing particles and then the interaction of the particles with the detector. So I'm just going to call those pre-detector and um, detector simulations. And uh, so imagine we have one high statistics expensive simulation that includes the detector simulation. And now imagine I have another simulation of just the pre-detector part. What I can do is I can take, the idea is can I take the expensive one and this cheap one and reweight the expensive one using just the pre-detector part. So that's the kind of the setting that we have in mind. And the idea is to do full space, full phase space reweighting with neural networks. So the idea is um, extremely simple. And now let me just describe it in symbols. So suppose I have some simulated event and let's call it X. So X could be the properties of many hundreds or thousands of particles, including all their momentum, momenta, as well as the types of particles. And if I have two simulations, uh, let's say one is represented by P of X, the probability distribution function, and the other one is Q of X. So if I, if I want to reweight one simulation into another simulation, that is to say, I want to do, I have one simulation and I want it to be as statistically identical to another one, I would just take every event X and give it a per event weight of Q of X over P of X. Um, now, uh, what if I can't evaluate Q and P? That's the setting we're in. I told you I'm never going to write down P and Q separately. So uh, I'm not able to take this ratio. So instead, um, the idea is very simple. Train a neural network to distinguish the two samples. So I have my P sample and my Q sample. I can sample from them, so I can generate data sets um, and train a classifier called F. And it's not that hard to show that if F is optimal, optimal in the Neyman Pearson sense, and you train with cross entropy, though it turns out you can train with many different um, loss functions, that this particular combination of the output of the neural network is proportional to the likelihood ratio. So, <coughs> um, and in fact, for reweighting, you don't care about the proportionality constant because everyone gets, an, you know, if it's an overall constant, it doesn't matter. Um, however, in this case, you actually can also derive the proportionality constant if you want to know it. 
Um, so this is great. I can train a classifier, and that allows me to learn the likelihood ratio, which is exactly the reweighting I need to do. And why I'm happy about this is because classification is easy, but generation is hard. OK. So uh, let me show you an example of how this would work in practice. So I want to learn a classifier on the full phase space. So that's this high dimensional space. I can't visualize it, but it has you know, hundreds of thousands of particles, each with um, three bits of information, their momentum, as well as the type of particle. And then I'm going to validate that this reweighting works by looking at low dimensional observables. So uh, our events have a variable number of particles, actually. So you can't just train um, a simple fully connected network to evaluate these data. So instead, we use a, um, a variant of um, deep sets. So we have a variable number of particles, they're permutation invariant. And so uh, the variant is called particle flow networks, which is basically deep sets with some particle physics um, uh, structure baked in to take in particles. And so let me show you how this works in practice. We train this classifier to distinguish two data sets. In this case, there's a, a blue data set and an orange data set. And these are high dimensional data sets, but I'm only showing you one dimensional um, observables computed from the data sets. And the idea is to train the classifier and then do the reweighting. And the black dashed line is the reweighted distribution. So um, I'm going from blue to orange, and the black is the reweighted blue, black dashed. And this is, a, for instance, the number of particles in the event. And this is some three particle correlation function. It doesn't really matter what the, what the features are, but just to say that they're non-trivial features. <laughs> and you can compute any feature you like on this high dimensional space, and you'll find that the black dash is basically identical to the orange. So it's really working. So by training this classifier, we're able to reweight from the blue to the orange very effectively. So that's great. It seems to be working. But we can take it a step further. Um, we can say, what if I uh, have variations that are either subtle or localized, so, or, or both? So, here are now some ratios of histograms of some observables where uh, you can see the blue is what I get if I have two simulations before reweighting, and the orange is after reweighting. And the, the, this column here shows a variation that's very subtle. Um, for the experts in the audience, we've just changed one of the hadronization parameters. And this has very little effect across the phase space, so like 5 10% effects. And you see that across the board, the orange is really consistent with one in the ratio, so it's really learning how to subtly change all the distributions. And this right column is an even crazier one, where we've only changed the number of strange quark particles produced, which is kind of a weird thing you would do to a simulation, but why not? And so in this high dimensional space, it literally only changes one dimension, which we know about ahead of time, which is this one here. The number of these strange particles is called cans. And you see everywhere else it learns to do nothing. And here it learns to correctly um, reweight the crazy perturbation into, the, into this um, flat one. So even if, the dis even if this is a really small or subtle effect, uh, it's, it's able to learn because classification in this case is, is very powerful. OK, uh, so we can take this a step further, even, more, even further, by instead of doing discrete reweighting, do continuous reweighting. So imagine I have not two simulations, but a family of simulations parameterized by some parameters theta. Theta could be um, not just one parameter, but, but many parameters. And it's very easy to do this. You simply learn a classifier, a parameterized classifier. And the way this works is you just add theta to your set of features. So x before was just all of my particles and their properties. And now I just, to every event, augment that with theta. And I just train a classifier just as before, simple classification. And it learns to interpolate. Um, and here's a plot that shows the reweighting um, between uh, two different samples where I'm going to parameterize reweighting. And so uh, this is the chi-squared per degree of freedom after the reweighting. And this is before the reweighting. Um, where the one sample has this alpha value of 0.16, and then I scan the alpha values. So I have, I have discreetly discrete points that are used for training. Actually, in this case, there was continuous points for training, but it doesn't really matter. And then uh, it interpolates, so I have a, a, a test set where I'm able to then um, smoothly interpolate it and then fit, um, uh, fit the parameters. Okay. But we can even take this one more step further. This is the last step, I promise. Um, where instead of have, once you have a continuous reweighting function, you can actually use it to fit. So we can combine parameterized reweighting um, with a, a loss function based on the classifier to extract model parameters. So um, my parameterized classifier will look like this. So this is, for instance, cross entropy. I have my, um, the sample I want to reweight um, from, the sample I want to reweight to, and this is just a normal classifier where I've just, like I said, augmented the features x with my parameters theta. And once I've trained this, uh, for instance, f can be a neural network, 
um, I can use it to do parameter estimation. So the idea is now imagine I have this, this classifier um, here where I have some other, this is my initial one I want to start from, and this is my, let's say, data. I, I don't actually know what theta one is. I want to learn what theta one is. So I can take the learned f from here, and now given the data from theta one, my, my unknown um, parameter, I can, minimize, I can maximize this function, and I claim that theta star here will actually be um, theta one. It's not hard to show by combining this and that function, but basically this allows us to use, the use a classifier as a loss in high dimensions to, with, combined with parameterized reweighting to extract the, um, the, the parameters theta star or theta. So let me show how this works. So here is a, basically just an, an illustration that it works. So we have, um, once again, it's a high dimensional um, feature space, but we're doing a fit for three parameters. I'm only showing a slice in two dimensions, but here you can see the, the loss landscape. Um, basically, the loss landscape here is right, the classifier loss landscape, and it's starting from some parameter point here, and this, these show the steps of stochastic green, of the epochs, actually, and it converges on the, the true value, which is the, the green one here. And it doesn't really matter where you start them, it's just an illustration, but basically this, this works to use the classifier not only for the reweighting, but also for the fitting. Now, this, uh, this works really well when you're doing the fit and the reweighting, both pre-detector. But clearly, um, in this case, the x here and the x here has to be the same. But what if it's not the same? What if I want to do my reweighting based on the pre-detector part and the fitting based on the post-detector part? Um, that's a, um, another common example. And you can also do that um, with a similar idea. So here is a more complicated looking loss function, but it's, it's kind of a similar idea. So we have the, the reweighting function, which is the same one as before. So it's this f over 1 minus f. This is a, a pre-trained classifier continuously parameterized classifier to do my reweighting. And then I have um, some uh, detector level same, uh, uh, observations. So XD is supposed to be detector level. XT is supposed to be true, so before the detector. And uh, the idea is this is my data. This is my reweighted simulation. And I just um, optimize this loss function. And the idea is that G is now some classifier. And the intuition is that I train a classifier to distinguish my data and my reweighted simulation. And then I keep reweighting until my classifier is confused as possible. It's sort of like a GAN, except here f is pre-trained. So I have like this continuous reweighting, um, which is moving parameters around. And then I have a classifier to distinguish. When the classifier is confused, I've learned the right parameter. And that's the, the theta star right here. I don't have an example that shows it works, but it, it works similarly to the other example I showed. OK. So uh, that actually brings me um, close to the end. I want to um, review a few things before I close. So first, I have told you about two applications of likely free generative models. So first was, was GANs. That was uh, ab initio simulations to um, generate new examples. And there were multiple applications. I showed you one, which was the acceleration of our simulation, in particular our calorimeter simulation, which is one of the slowest parts of our simulation. The challenge there is to achieve fidelity. So it's very fast, but we need it to be good. I also told you about high dimensional reweighting, which is a sort of complementary approach, where instead of um, generating new examples, now you take an existing library of examples and you reweight them, morph them into a new set of examples. And so this uh, allows you to achieve precision. So you saw I was able to, we were able to achieve sort of percent level or better precision across a huge phase space by doing this reweighting because classifiers are very powerful. Um, and you can even combine this with uh, fitting by doing parameterized classification. Um, but the, the, the challenge here is that uh, one, of, one of the key challenges is that um, you cannot use this to generate new samples. So it's only possible to remorph one, one into another. So you need to have at least one existing sample to, to, to work with. OK, uh, so that brings me to the end. Um, generative models are really essential in um, fundamental science, in particular high energy physics, to connect our fundamental theories to the observations in our detector. We want to work backwards, basically, to, predict, to understand the theory of everything from our detector. And for that, we need the forward model based on physics simulations. And deep learning can, can accelerate and, and enhance this work. So um, I have in the slides, which I think will be posted, some, some references as well as um, code and data sets if you're curious to play around. And uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators, of course, and all the, the generative projects that I showed today. And if you have uh, any questions, I'm happy to talk about them now. Thanks.